You're going to have to bear with me this morning. I woke up this morning with not much of a voice. So, um, so I've got the low voice. I told Ashley I could sing some Johnny Cash because my voice is so low right now. But this week, we're going to start a new series, and we're going to take a couple weeks and look at the prophet Jeremiah. And we're going to look at different segments in the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to look at different examples of how God used him. And our series is called The People God Uses. And we're going to see that how God used him and reflect on how God uses us. And the first week, I want to look at excuses. Because as a society, let me tell you, we are good at making ex excuses. We are absolutely fantastic at it. You know when something goes up, comes up, we're supposed to do, you hear things like, oh, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I can't do that. Or oh, I didn't understand. You mean I was supposed to be there then? Really? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I've got other plans. Or I couldn't find the right tools. Or how about, oh, no, I can't do that. The game's on. I can't do that. Steelers are playing right now. I mean, or, oh, I have a doctor's appointment. And as much as I love to go to the doctor, I just I can't help you. Or there's been a death in the family. You know, sometimes you use the excuse that the same person died three different times. And... Or, you know, the hazmat crew's here. They won't let me out of the house. I'm sorry. I can't help. For, for people in society, we like to use excuses. We like to use all sorts of excuses. And it's no different for believers. Let me, let me share some with you and see if these sound familiar. Oh, you want me to do that? That's the preacher's job. Or, no, that's not my gift. I'm not called to do that. Or, I already served this week. Can't you get somebody else? Or, I'm too busy. Or, I'm too tired. Or, I'm too old. Or, I'm too young. But we are all called to serve. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. We have all been given different gifts. You know, Jesus describes in his parables gifts of five, three, and one. We all have different varied gifts, but they are all gifts nonetheless. We all have different ways we can serve and be a part of the kingdom. Now, when God had called Jeremiah, at first, Jeremiah was ready to throw an excuse out there. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. <coughs> but he was ready to throw an excuse when God had called him. But we are called not to make excuses. Listen to the words beginning of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. This is what it says. The words of Jeremiah the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anatoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah had been called to be a prophet. We have all been called to serve in various ways. But I feel like sometimes we don't feel like we're capable of doing what God wants us to do. Let me read again verse 5 there in Jeremiah 1. He said, before I formed you in the womb, 
I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah. And he knew what he could do. He had created him. He had made him. And guess what? God knows each and every one of us as well. He knows everything about us. He knows our good qualities. He knows our bad qualities. God knows us. And he knows what we're capable of doing. And he will use us if we're willing. But sometimes we get in the mindset that we think we know better. I know, God, you're wanting me to do this, but I don't think I can. I don't think I can do this. I want to give four different examples this morning of excuses that people like to make. A couple of them Jeremiah uses. But four different examples we can find in Jeremiah chapter 1. And the first one I want to look at is my talent is inadequate. My talent is inadequate. We have said, God, I'm not capable of doing this. Well, listen to verse 6 in Jeremiah 1. After God had just said, I formed you in the womb, I consecrated you, I know what's going on with you. Jeremiah says in verse 6, Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. After God says he knows Jeremiah and he knows what he can do, Jeremiah turns around and says, but God, I can't talk. You don't want to send me as a prophet. That's not what I'm good at. If you remember, he's not the only one who gave that excuse. Moses gave that very excuse when God called him. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. But then God reminded Moses what he could do. He said, we find it in verse 11. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Listen, God knows what we can do. It may be easy to feel like we don't have enough talent. We may feel, feel insecure in what we can do. And when we start doing things like that and turn down those times that we can serve, it ends up going to other people, people that we think are better suited that should be doing it. And then it turns into a dump. Then it turns into one person doing multiple jobs instead of many people having the job spread out to do among them. And you have those people who are carrying the load getting burned out. And it does a real disservice to the church because you got the people working hard just wore out and you have the people who could be serving not and then the church isn't serving well together listen you may feel inadequate at times but God equips you don't forget that God equips you In verse 9 of Jeremiah 1 listen to what the Lord says then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. God equipped Jeremiah for his gift and his gift being prophecy. God will equip us for the things we can do to serve. And there's many opportunities to serve, many different ways that we can serve. I love the words in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. God wants each and every one of us to serve and not make excuses. Now, Jeremiah wasn't done making excuses. He still had another one up his sleeve. He tries to give another excuse. And I want to go back and uh, Jeremiah 1, I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. And we're going to see the other excuse Jeremiah tries to give. Again, Jeremiah 1, verses 6 through 8. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah tried to give the excuse, I'm too young. Haven't we tried to do that sometimes? Haven't we tried to say, the time's not right. The time's not right. This isn't the right season. That's the christian -y phrase I hear a lot. This isn't the right season to do something. And that excuse is used especially when people just don't want to do it. They don't want to serve. And you know, sometimes there are those instances when it may not be the right season. But most of the time, it's a hard issue. We don't want to do it, or we're worried about it. And so we put that over willing to serve God. It's a matter of choice. And we're choosing not. We're choosing something else. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that no one can serve two masters. We have a choice to make. We can either serve our desires or we can serve God. We can either serve our fear and live our life afraid of doing anything, or we can serve God. We have to make that choice. But God is wanting to use us, and those opportunities come up. And many people will jump in and say, nope, it's, it's just not a good time. Have somebody else do this. This is not a good time. And they make an excuse. Well, in Luke 14, Jesus tells some stories. And then these stories are good examples of excuses. When people say it's not the right time. In Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, we find one story, one account. And I want you to listen to this. Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. It says this. One Sabbath... When he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. The tradition was you didn't do anything on the Sabbath because it was work. It wasn't the right time. And how many times you look in the Gospels and Jesus got in trouble with the Pharisees and the apostles got in trouble because they did something on the Sabbath. And let me ask, if somebody was sick, if you had a family member who was sick, who was hurting, would you look at them and go, no, it's a Sabbath, I'm not helping you. No, we would help them because that is the right time, because that is when they need help. When we see the need, we help. Jesus goes on to tell a story further down in the chapter in verses 16 to 24. 
Luke 14, verses 16 to 24, and listen to what it says. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who have been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married my wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master had said to his servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Here we see this story of this banquet. And we find these people who are just making up all, making all sorts of excuses. And we see that because of their excuses, we can tell their hearts are not with God. It's easy to fall into excuses. It's easy to fall into that trap. And we can give some pretty good excuses. But let me ask you, is the reason you're giving legitimate or is the reason you're giving for the excuse just to not have to serve? Just so you can do what you want. We must be very careful and not let our hearts get caught in this trap. Now some people, when they say it's not the right season, they say it's not the right season because they're genuinely concerned. They may feel like, well, I'm not... I'm not ready. God, I am too young. Or, God, that season's already passed. I, I, I just, I just don't know. That season's already passed. If you're getting called, those opportunities arise. Remember, God will provide. Jeremiah 1, verse 7 and 8. Let me read it again. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Paul says the same thing to Timothy. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Some people make the excuse because they just don't want to do it. They say it's the wrong season because they don't want to do it. Others are concerned. But God says he sends us and he wants us to serve. And it's not the age, the season that's the issue. What's the example you're setting? How are you living? How's your maturity? I mean... Look throughout the Bible. David was young when he defeated Goliath. Moses was 80 when he led the people out of Egypt. Don't use that as an excuse. Don't use that as an excuse. As we continue to look at Jeremiah's story, God has given Jeremiah a difficult task. It's not an easy one. God is telling Jeremiah to speak to the people, and he knows the message is not positive. It is not a message that he wants to deliver because he's telling them of the bad news is what's going to happen to his people. And Jeremiah would go through a lot of struggles. 
up to the point of death, just to that edge. See, people didn't want to hear the truth. And what Jeremiah was sharing, it was going to be pretty hard to share. But let me share with you a little bit of what he had to share. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Boiling pots were usually in the Jewish people's homes. And it says there, facing away from the north. Well, usually the boiling pots set level. They were either for food or clothing. And they set level. And what they had in it was scalding, was hot. And it was a facing away from the north so it could fall down towards, fall out towards the south. And whatever it hit, it would really hurt This is a representation, the boiling pot being Babylon. And that scalding water, what it fell on would be Israel. It would be God's people. And it was gonna be hard to share that his people, that God's people were gonna get attacked and defeated and they were going to lose everything so the excuse number three is the teaching is dangerous now this isn't one that jeremiah said but we could easily fall into this trap that the teaching is dangerous today we can say the teaching of jesus is dangerous it could get us into trouble publicly because it goes against what the mainstream society says right now. People can get attacked, called all sorts of names, physically hurt, even death for sharing the name of Jesus. And that is coming closer and closer to happening here. Some places it can cost you your job to share Jesus. I don't know how many articles I've read of coaches losing their job because they pray with their team before a game. just because they prayed. Sharing the gospel of Jesus can cost us. It can be dangerous. The gospel is dangerous, there's no doubt about it. The good news cost Jesus his very life. It costs almost every apostle his very, their very lives. But without the good news, without us being willing to have that courage and share Jesus, the dangers are far more greater. Because what we share what we are sharing, we have to share because it is the message of eternal life. It is the message of eternal hope. Would you rather be quiet and not share Jesus to somebody and take a chance of hoping they heard it someplace else? or take that chance and share Jesus. Knowing you gave it to somebody the greatest thing that they could ever receive. Whether they accept it or not, it's their choice. But it's on us as believers to share the greatest message in history. 
And listen, it wasn't easy for Jeremiah. It's not easy for us. But just because it's not easy doesn't mean we don't do it. Just because it's not comfortable doesn't mean we don't share it. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, it says, And I, behold, I will make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Do you see what God's saying there? He's going to be with us through all of this. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but he's going to be with us every step of the way. We don't go in fear because we think we're alone. We're not alone. We are not alone. 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes to Timothy, For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. We must be willing to stand like Daniel stood or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We must be willing to stand like Stephen did, like the apostles did. Yes, the gospel is dangerous, but the message is too significant. It is too essential not to share. Don't make the excuse that the gospel is too dangerous. Share Jesus. God will be with you through the, every step. One final excuse I want to look at this morning. We find it in verse 17 of Jeremiah 1. In verse 17 it says, But you, dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them everything that I commanded you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. God's telling Jeremiah, it's time to go. Get up. Get dressed. Come on. Let's go. Time to get out the door. And the final excuse I want to look at this morning is us turning around and saying, do I have to go now? Do I have to go now? Does it have to be now? Can't it? Can't we do it at like this afternoon? Next week? Can we do it next month? Does it have to be now? There's a couple different examples of people saying that they would want to follow Jesus. And Jesus talks to them. And we find this in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I want to give one of those examples. We find it in verses 59 through 62. Luke chapter 9, verses 59 through 62. And it says, to another he said, follow me. He being Jesus. He says, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow looks back as fit for the kingdom of God. I want to look at that first one. The guy who says, let me go bury my father. And you may think, well, that's awful harsh. Why won't you just let him go back and bury his dad? He'll be back with us in two days. Well, see, here's the deal. In this story, what I, the thing I've studied about this is the father's probably not dead. He's talking about, well... His father's still alive, but he's going to be dead 
soon. Relative term soon could mean two weeks, could mean two years, could mean a decade. Let me do that with my dad. And however long that takes, then I will come and follow you. And Jesus knows this man's heart. He says, let the dead bury the dead. I'm calling you to come now. This is quite the opposite reaction to when Jesus called some of the apostles. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, listen to what it says here. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately, they left the boat and their father and follow him. What did he say? Follow me. And they just dropped it and followed because following God is the greatest thing we can do. It should be our first priority. We don't know how much time we have. I look around at all of us. We can say, oh yeah, I've got 30 years, I got 40 years, I got 10 years, I got this long. We don't know how much time we have. We may get in this car and drive home and be in a bad car wreck. We don't know how much time we have. The time is now to follow. The time is now to serve. Take every opportunity that you have to follow. Take every opportunity you have to be willing to follow God. Don't make excuses, but choose to serve. I said we don't know how much time we have, and that goes for giving our life to Christ as well. If there's somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus, hey, we don't know how much time you have left here on this earth. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, now is the time to do that. The only moment you have is the moment you're living in. It's the only moment you're guaranteed to have. Many people have said, oh, when I'm older, I'll give my life to Jesus. And then something happens. And they don't. Don't make that mistake. Give your life to Christ. Follow him. Be willing to serve. Greatest thing we can ever do is to give your life to Jesus. We're going to close right now with a song of invitation. We're going to sing the wonderful cross. And in that, we sing the newer version that has that chorus. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. You want to find life, you'll find it in Jesus. So sing with us as we sing this song of invitation.